What makes a combat sports god? A line of Benzes in the driveway? Getting to fight a YouTuber? No, it's being untouchable in the octagon. Now, normally gods are created, molded with performance after performance at the highest level until their greatness becomes undeniable and almost bow down and kiss their feet. I'll find you and make you kiss my feet. But sometimes all it takes is one performance over the best in your weight class, the champion, one perfect victory to have your name sung through the streets and your face on a Wheaties box. With every fan on the planet wondering what on earth could possibly stop this person now. I'm Balian from MMA On Point and these are 10 champs who look like gods with a single win. Number 10, Anthony Pettis over Benson Henderson. Two. Okay, so let's get one thing straight. The WEC was awesome. World Extreme Cage Fighting stabled the lighter weight classes that weren't yet in the UFC in the late noughties, as well as a stacked lightweight division and basically anyone who's cool came out of there. Yeah, I said it. That includes Benson Henderson and Anthony Pettis, who clashed for the WEC Lightweight Championship in December 2010. You'll remember that fight. Anthony ran off the wall like a ninja, and then the promotion got shut down with Showtime as the last champion. He didn't get a title shot right away in the UFC. Gray Maynard and Frankie Edgar went to a draw. Pettis lost a tough fight against Clay Guida, but then beat three top UFC lightweights and got to rematch Benson, this time for the UFC title. Because Benson had been nothing but dominant during his time in the UFC. In fact, he tied the record for the most title defense is a lightweight, beat the champ Edgar twice, and had a super annoying game that almost everyone had trouble dealing with. But in his hometown of Milwaukee at UFC 164, Showtime got his title shot. He stopped all of the initial takedowns, and when they broke from the fence, started firing organ pulverizing body kicks. Ben kind of landed on top of Anthony, and he threw up a championship winning armbar. Just like that, it was over in the first round. At the time, Pettis looked like the next big thing, a total phenom. His striking had melted Benson, he'd stopped all the takedowns, and his BJJ finished one of the best grapplers in the division. All of that from just one win. Number nine, Jose Aldo over Mike Brown. All right, well, I've already mentioned the WEC and what they were all about, but especially at Featherweight, for at least the first three years of the promotion, the division was dominated by Uriah Faber. He beat everyone they put in front of him, defended the belt five times, finished all but one opponent, but then the big wrestler Mike Brown showed up and stopped him in the first round. It was crazy impressive, and then he cemented his place as the champ as he defended the belt two times as well. But meanwhile, there had been this incredibly athletic knockout machine called Called Jose Aldo, who'd been battering everyone that weighed at 145 pounds. At WEC 41, when Mike rematched Faber to defend his title for the second time, Jose fought Cub Swanson and obliterated him in just eight seconds. So yeah, they gave him a title shot after that. The future king of Rio had already looked outstanding, but once the fight with Brown began, it was clear it was on a completely different level. He stuffed all the takedowns of ease and clinically outstruck Mike on his feet. When it did hit the mat in the second round, it was over immediately. Jose took his back and pounded him out. There was a new WEC champion and as the commentators proclaimed who the hell was going to beat this guy well the answer was no one for like a good long while but regardless after he took out mike aldo already looked like a demigod number eight cody garbrandt over dominic cruz all right, so if you don't know, Dominic Cruz was basically the man back in the day at 135 pounds. His fight IQ, technical prowess, and ability to shift the game plan on a dime made him incredibly difficult to deal with, no matter your skill as a martial artist. It was enough that even when Henan Burrell took over his position as champion in the UFC, people still weren't convinced of his reign unless he beat Cruz, because Cruz had just been that good. Also, incredibly, five years since his last title fight, he came back to beat TJ Dillashaw, the guy who was firmly accepted as the new champion. But along came Cody bloody Garbrandt, didn't he? In one year, he'd gone from UFC debut to title shot, and he'd beaten five opponents along the way. Another split in this banana was the fact that Cody was representing Team Alpha Male, who'd long been rivals with the Dominator, and tried and failed on five separate occasions to solve the Rubik's Cruz but not Cody. On that cold winter's night in December 2016, he hit the level up button and sprung around the octagon like a footloose Kevin Bacon. We saw the power and the hand speed, yes, but we also saw a completely new layer of potential to peel back as he read Dom's every move and counted him every step of the way. By the time they strapped the belt around him, it was clear the next generation was here, and based on that performance and that version of Cody, it didn't look like anyone would be stopping him anytime soon. Funny how MMA math plays out though, right? Number seven, Francis Ngannou over Stipe Miocic, two. It was all very exciting watching Francis the Destroyer carve his way to the top of the heavyweight division. Ultimately, he fought the champ Stipe and we saw the holes in his game exploited. He was too wild and the more well-rounded guy Miocic was able to capitalize time and time again until Francis was basically dead tired. 
So it was back to the rankings for Francis, and after another snoozer with Derek Lewis that had us all worried he was losing his mojo, it was back to playing shutdown to the rest of the division. And the Predator might as well have shoulder plasma casted his next four opponents, because JDS lasted the longest, a whopping 1 minute and 11 seconds before, like everyone else, he ended up on the canvas. Those fights had ended quickly, and we hadn't really had a chance to see any improvements from Francis, which kind of meant going into the rematch with Stipe most expected much of the same thing to happen. But holy shit, was this a completely different fight. The bell sounded and Nganu stalked Stipe and executed perfect takedown defense and then just punished him. In the end, it was all too easy for Francis. Every hole he seemed to have, he'd fixed and he looked like a well-rounded mixed martial artist. And after he KO'd Stipe, he couldn't have been scarier. All that power now in a controlled, well-executed form. Who was going to beat this guy? With one win, Francis had flipped his entire narrative and pretty much became this untouchable, immortal heavyweight champion. I think they call those gods. Number six, Islam Mahachev over Charles Oliveira. It's no secret what the narrative was going into this fight, that Charles had beaten the breaks off the top five of the division and Islam hadn't fought anyone near the same level, at least in terms of the UFC rankings. There was also the fact that Charles had the most submissions and the most finishes ever in the history of the UFC and he was going against the grappler who would play right into his strengths. But for all their accolades, this was still a fight that was almost impossible to predict going into it. All we knew was Charles had proved himself 10 times over to be as good as he was, and with Islam, well, we were about to find out. Throughout the course of the fight, though, it was pretty clear that despite Islam not having fought his way through the top 10, he was levels above the champion. He executed a near flawless game plan and topped it off by subbing the very guy who'd forced more people to tap than Michael Flatley. In that moment of victory and through that performance, he went from questionable contender to possible number one pound for pound, which says, a lot about his single win, wouldn't you say? Number five, Conor McGregor over Jose Aldo. All right, as much as it's been talked about, we can't exactly leave Conor McGregor off this list if we're being realistic. The guy did stir up a hurricane of fan support on his stampede to the UFC title, but because he had done it with such bravado, and let's be honest, selective matchmaking, there were still plenty of questions by the time he squared off against Jose. Yeah, you've been knocking everyone out, but at the same time, Aldo hadn't lost in 10 years, and who was a better striker than him at 145? Well, the answer had historically been nobody, and although Connor was the interim champion, his notoriety had him at just number 13 pound for pound, but Aldo had been pushed to number one. Still, the cage closed on 194, and Connor took just 13 seconds to fell the champion, and with pretty much one left hand, was elevated to god status by his disciples. To be fair, he had in two years ran through the best 145 had to offer and completely flipped the division on its head. The following week, he catapulted up 10 places to the number three pound for pound, and the aura that surrounded him made you believe he was pretty much capable of anything. No critics could argue with the Aldo performance, and technically, he'd just taken out the number one pound for pound guy in the world. The Jose KO was his coronation as the new king of the weight class. And he got to sit in his conqueror's throne at the time as the most famous man in the sport. Number four, Lyoto Machida over Sugar Rashad Evans. Okay, listen, there is a reason they called it the Machida era. If you've been following this channel long enough, you know I've documented Lyoto's run to the belt many times, but the key thing to note is he was basically getting hit as much as Hamzat Chemaev, except the dragon almost kept every fight on the feet where you had a better chance of hitting the first sword of Bravos. Either way, people were also super hyped by the fact Karate was making a comeback. I mean, this was years before Cobra Kai, okay? And once again, it carried this element of mystery as Machida's karate techniques were running circles around what was supposed to be the best way to fight, at least according to the last 20 years of MMA evolution. Question was, could he win a title with that style, or even beat one of the best wrestlers in the division at the time, the champ Rashad Evans? Turns out, yes, yes he could. At UFC 98, you needed just eight minutes to find the chin of Rashad and send him to the Shadow Realm. How many times did he get hit? Like four, four significant strikes. After he collapsed Rashad, the Machida era felt like it was here. He'd proven everything people said he couldn't do, 15 and 0, UFC champion, barely taken a punch in the last few years. Honestly, it doesn't get much more godlike than that. Number three, BJ Penn over Matt Hughes. One of the first and biggest UFC hype trains had to be BJ Penn. By the time of only his third UFC fight and an 11 second knockout of Carl Uno, he was already a superstar. It was a combination of his aggressive style, BJJ credentials, and a bad boy attitude. The UFC set up a title fight with Jens Pulver, but ultimately BJ would fall short, and when he did fight his way back to compete for the vacant title two years later, it ended in a draw, and the division was scrapped entirely. But there was still reason to believe in BJ. His incredible boxing skills, his ability to take a sharp, defend, take and then choke you unconscious. The following year, after a brief stint at K1 to collect the Rumble on the Rock Championship, BJ returned to the UFC to take on Matt Hughes. 
for the welterweight title. And honestly, most people counted him out. Pretty much one of the reasons he got the shot was because Matt had already beaten everyone else in the division. So he was a massive underdog going into the fight, probably against the most dominant guy the UFC had on roster. But BJ won every exchange on the feet before putting the wrestler Matt on his back where his black belt paid off and tapping him with just 30 seconds left in the first round. It was an upset of epic proportions. BJ had nullified everything Matt had and in doing so looked like the complete package. He looked like the prodigy. The fan base exploded based on this achievement alone and he basically ascended to godhood and mixed martial arts immortality. Number two, John Jones over Shogun Hua. Honestly, it was one of the singular most impressive performances ever. John had been a pro fighter for just three years, but put together an MMA game that contained unstoppable wrestling and unpredictable striking, which led him to winning every position, exchange, and scramble he had had in the UFC. After beating every other contender in the division, including Ryan Bader, he was presented with an in-octagon opportunity to fight Shogun Hua for the belt, on short notice, but he still accepted. Most people believe John was the next best thing, the future of the division, but Shogun had embarked on a career against every name in mixed martial arts, and like Neo, had been the first man to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with an agent in Lyoto Machida and defeat him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So there was still this belief that he could solve the puzzle the lanky John Jones possessed, but yeah, that just wasn't the case at all. John did absolutely whatever he wanted to do to Shogun and there was nothing the Brazilian could do to stop him. It was a coming out party for John and a chance on the biggest stage to show that even the world's best had nothing to offer him in terms of competition. He stole every trophy Hua had collected in his cabinet and sat the 205 throne as the undisputed pound for pound best, an unstoppable godlike force of nature and also the youngest to ever do it. After beating Shogun, there was no denying John and he pretty much became untouchable. Well, not to himself, obviously. And number one, Mark Coleman over Dan Seven. So UFC 1 proved its point, right? That Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was the best singular martial art on the planet when going up against its various other counterparts. But as soon as everyone worked out what grappling and submissions were, it was pretty cool to see that even in just two or three years, the sport started to change. It was Dan Seven who first came over with his wrestling base and demonstrated that slamming someone into the mat and holding them there while you continuously punch him in the face, yeah, it's a pretty effective strategy. It's how he won UFC 5, the Ultimate Ultimate Tournament, and the Super Super fight at UFC 9. So then all these other wrestlers started showing up realizing they could use the same tactics, but none of them were bigger and badder than Mark the Hammer Coleman. I mean, just look at the dude. It's 1997, that's the freaking poster boy right there. When you tell someone about cage fighting, this is the dude they picture in their heads as being the champion. So when he started also absolutely smashing everyone at UFC 10 and UFC 11, everyone climbed on board the hammer train. And at UFC 12, they brought back the super fight champion Dan Seven to decide who was actually the ultimate fighter. Not only did Mark pretty easily stuff Dan's takedowns, but he started smacking him about on the feet. He eventually got a scaffold and started squeezing Dan's head off his neck. Mark became the new heavyweight champion and was immediately put on a pedestal as the greatest fighter to ever walk the planet with an unbeatable style and son of Zeus-like physique, this might as well have been ancient Greece with a god walking among us. Speaking of ancient Greece and gods, our very own best boy, Luke Taylor, has been editing away putting this video together for you. Hope you enjoyed it. If you want to show him some support, you can find him on social media at cool to me underscore. And you might as well throw Ben Rosette in the god tier section of YouTube musicians as well. He's got his own music you could listen to as well as that song in the intro. If you want to check him out, you can do at Ben Rosette. Which MMA fighters did you look up to as gods? Anything that stands out to you as a deity moment? I know I've missed a few, but we do top tens here, don't we? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, a like is always appreciated. The subscribe button is right there as well if you want to click it and get updated on more from us. We do free videos a week. I've been Bailey, and thank you for watching. You can catch me at Bailey and underscore plays or on Twitch. I'll see you in the next one.